This uh, last part of chapter 2 is about classifying costs, which is actually extremely critical because it's, it's used a lot in later chapters, specifically 6 and 11, and I'll show you where. So why do we bother classifying costs? Well, there are three big reasons I'm going to talk about. The first, and probably one of the more important uh, and more useful, uh, is to predict cost behavior when activity levels change. So that if our volume increases or decreases, what happens to our costs? Now you may think right away, well, our costs will drop or our costs will rise. Yes, they will. But will all costs drop and will all costs rise? This is where we want to classify costs. And we're going to introduce you to three new words or three terms here. The first is variable costs. And it's important to classify certain costs as variable. How do we know something is variable? Well, very simple. The cost itself varies in direct proportion to changes in the level of activity. Let me write that out for you so you have it. They vary in direct proportion to changes in the level of activity. Now, the level of activity could be anything. It could be, if you're a hotel, the number of rooms rented. If you're a dentist, the number of patients you have. If uh, you're a, a manufacturer, the number of units you make or the amount of labor hours you incur. So we're going to find out later on when we get to, uh, to, to Chapter 6 that, that it could, the level of activity could be anything. A good example is direct materials. Every time we make something new, we need more material. So it varies in direct proportion with what we make. So here's a little, uh, a little chart to sort of help you out. We'll put uh, dollars on the vertical axis and activity on the horizontal. And we'll draw a line that looks like this. It intersects the intercept at 0, 0, because if we make nothing, well, it costs us nothing. That's the whole idea behind variable costs. You'll notice that total variable costs increase as volume or activity increases, the total variable cost. But, and this is a very important distinction, but the variable cost per unit, the variable cost per unit is constant. It just so happens that every time we add a unit, we add the same cost, so our total cost goes up, but the variable cost per unit is constant. Total variable cost increases as activity increases. Let's move on to another big cost category in, uh, in, in uh, uh, predicting cost behavior, that of fixed costs. And as the name implies, a fixed cost remains constant uh, as activity changes. Now, when I say it remains constant as activity changes, over some range, so if you have a, one machine that's capable of making up to 10,000 units of something and you move from 7,000 units to 9,000 units, you don't need another machine. That cost is constant. But if you go over 10,000 units, now you need another machine. That's why we, we uh, specify over some range these costs are fixed. And we call that range the relevant range. So let's... Uh, Let's have a look at what this looks like in a chart form. The same thing we did with um, with variable cost. We'll put the uh, total cost on the uh, vertical axis, volume or activity on the horizontal axis. And we see that fixed cost is nothing more than a straight line. So as you see, this, as volume increases, the cost does not increase. So total fixed cost is constant. But... The fixed cost per unit decreases as the volume or activity increases. If you have, if you paid ten thousand dollars for a machine that only makes, and you've only made one unit, that's a pretty costly unit. But if you make ten thousand units on that machine, the fixed cost of that machine is spread over all those units. Finally we have what is called a mixed cost. And a mixed cost contains uh, both a variable and a fixed component. Think of your utility bill. Even if you use no utilities, there's a certain charge every month for delivering the utility service to your house. And then as you use utilities, your bill goes up. So it has a fixed component 
and a variable component. And we're going to revisit this in chapter 3, so I'm not going to go on about it here. You, you'll see a lot of it in the, in the next chapter, chapter 3. Well, what's another reason we want to track costs? We've already got one to, to uh, track behavior. Another one is so that we can assign costs to departments or to product lines. Uh, or to uh, patients, or to customers, or to, when we get to, especially to project uh, costing, we want to assign costs to specific projects, like construction, or uh, bridge building, etc. So what we want here are words we've seen before. Uh, direct costs, and we know that direct costs are traceable. If we have, we're have, we doing a specific job like building a house, all the material in that house we can trace to that house. Then we have indirect costs. These are costs that are not easily traceable. Same thing we did in chapter in earlier in Chapter 2 when we looked at direct materials and direct labor. And uh, we noticed that we have indirect labor and indirect materials, which are uh, costs that we cannot trace to a specific product. Uh, we call these costs, these indirect costs, common costs. And let me give you an example of a direct and an indirect cost. Let's say that uh, we have a bunch of stores in a given region. A store manager, the salary of that store manager, is easily traceable to that specific store. However, the regional manager is a common cost for all the stores, so if we went from 12 stores down to 11 stores, we'd get rid of the one store manager salary, but you'd still have the regional manager salary. That is common to, to, to that particular region, regardless of how many outlets you have. We're going to see much more of this in Chapter 11, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to bore you with it now. Just keep in mind that we are going to revisit this. And finally, we classify costs for decision making. Every decision we make has a, a cost and uh, there might be a cost for doing it one way and a different cost for doing it another way. And one way may provide some benefits, the other way provides another. So we need to classify costs for this purpose. So we have three here. The first one we call a differential cost. And if you look at the first part of the word, the root of the word, difference, uh, it is a difference in cost between two alternatives. And that's a differential cost. Uh, we can go here or we can go there. If we go here, it costs this much. If we go there, it costs that much. The difference is this many dollars. That's a differential cost. Uh, a difference in cost between two alternatives. Now, this cost, and when we're looking at the difference in cost, we could be looking at a variable cost. Or we could be looking at a fixed cost. We can rent this facility or that facility. We can use this part in our manufacturing process or we can use that part in our manufacturing process. So it, it can be fixed or it can be variable. And the, the key thing here is that only the difference, when we're making decisions, only the difference is relevant. Not the entire cost of one and the entire cost of two. Just the difference between the two uh, is, is what's relevant. So let me give you an example. Uh, you've all done this before. You've all bought a printer. You can buy a cheap printer or you can buy an expensive printer. Well, you know when you buy the cheap printer, the ink is really expensive. And when you buy the expensive printer, the ink is really cheap. So you can get a cheap printer and pay a lot to operate it or pay a lot for a printer and pay very little to operate it. Of course, the more you use your printer, the more you'll lean towards the more expensive printer because... Lower cost per page, right? The next cost category we're looking at under decision making is opportunity cost. This is a big one. And opportunity cost is also an economic term. It's not really an accounting term. Yet we have it in an accounting textbook. And let, let me explain this. An opportunity cost is the potential benefit that you give up when you choose one alternative over another. So think about it in terms of, uh, and I'll give an example shortly about uh, going, to, going to school or staying in a job, but uh, let me just continue on this before I go there. So it's a potential benefit you give up when you choose one alternative over another, and we've all done this, 
Should I go do this or should I do that? If I do that, I can't do the other thing, right? It is not, and I'm changing my, uh, my ink color here so that I can stress this. It is not an accounting term. It is not an accounting term. And it's not an accounting cost. By, by saying that, that means that you do not record an opportunity cost. There's no journal entry for an opportunity cost. It's not recorded. Uh, but when you're making decisions, you must consider the opportunity cost of your decision. You must. It's part of the decision process. But once you make the decision, whatever opportunity cost you incur, you do not record it as an accounting cost. It's only an economic cost. So let me give you a good example here. Uh, should I stay? Should I go to school? Now you're here in school, or you're at uh, at uh, uh, at class. You've given up a job to go to school. So when you make the decision to go to school, you give up the salary of a job that you could have. Now, in case you're thinking, "Yeah, that's right. I'm going to quit and go get a job." If you stay in your job, you're giving up the opportunity cost of making more money in the long run with a higher degree of education. There's a cost for every decision you make in terms of the benefits you give up on something else. Our last cost category basically is something we can just ignore, but we're going to mention it, is a sunk cost. Now, this is a cost that's already been incurred. Nothing you can do about it cannot be changed. A sunk cost is a cost already incurred that cannot be be changed. So no matter what decision you make, you can't change the fact that that money is gone. That money is spent. So what do we do with sunk costs? Well, they should be ignored. So when you're making decisions about something, any sunk cost, any money that's been spent that no matter what decision you make, that money's just gone, ignore that money. It doesn't even enter into the equation. So here's a good example. Let's say that you want to drop out in year two of school. You say, I'm going to drop out because I can make more in the market than, than this is costing me and I'm just going to go. Should you consider in your decision the amount of tuition you paid in your first year? No, because if you leave, you can't get that money back anyways. And if you stay, you can't get that money back anyways. It's a sunk cost. Don't even consider it. Now, look at this red ink here. This is very important. Trust me on this. I want you to go over review problem number one. It's on page 45 of your text. I'll make a note here so that you have it. This is critical. You must understand variable versus fixed versus mixed, direct versus indirect, differential versus opportunity versus sunk cost. We can have a cost that is variable, a product cost that's direct. Uh, so one cost can be classified under multiple things. It doesn't just have to be one. Do that problem. Trust me on this. Do that problem. <laughs>